All right. Well, good morning, Renew Church. Are you ready for the word? All right. They prepped us well. Amen. The worship team. Come on, let's give it up one more time for the worship team. Just what a blessing they are to our church family and the sacrifices they make of their time. And uh, you may or may not know this, but every single person on our worship ministry, including our AV team, all give of their time freely, right? They are not paid staff or paid musicians or singers. They give of their time freely. So we are grateful uh, for them and, the, and their sacrifice of service. I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 today. We're going to wrap up Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. This letter uh, has been such a powerful letter for us because even though Paul was writing this almost 2,000 years ago, uh, we still see the relevancy of this message to us today, right? We still see the value of Paul's words and what we learn not only about the Lord, but what we learn about who we are as Christians and how we should be living out our life. And one of the primary themes of this letter is how to protect the unity of the church, that it is of paramount importance that we adopt that attitude of that which is in Christ. You know, the, the, the number one key to disunity in the church is people not adapting the attitude of that which is in Christ, which is why Paul went to great lengths to explain that, yes, there are external forces that try to disrupt the unity of the church. We know there's a lot of things in our world that are trying to disrupt the unity of the church, but where he really spent the bulk of his emphasis was on talking about the threats to unity within the church. And so he lays out this attitude of that which is in Christ, and he challenges every Christian, not just those in Philippi, but us today to adopt that attitude of that which is in Christ, to, who, who didn't uh, consider equality with God something to be grasped. But, you know, as we talked about, he gave up his divine rights and privileges. He took on the form of a man, of flesh, and then he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross, that God would highly exalt him, right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know the text. We studied it deeply. If you weren't here, please go back and watch all of the messages for this sermon series but it brings us to this place today, which is really one of the other reasons why Paul wrote this letter. He started off the letter by thanking them for the gift that they sent. Now, the gift that they sent uh, didn't come from a store. That's not that kind of gift. It wasn't wrapped with a bow. The gift that they sent was a financial gift. It was an offering to Paul to help him in his time of need as he continued to advance the gospel. And so I've titled today's message, as I've examined this text, the blessing of partnership. The blessing of partnership. If you look inside your program, you are going to find a sermon outline that you can follow along with today's message. I'm going to spend a decent amount of time laying some foundational work for this passage of Scripture. Uh, I, I really could have spent the entire message just exegeting the context here, but I do believe there's a lot of meat that we need to take away from it. So I'm going to try to do my best to paint a picture of what's going on here and what we really need to understand that Paul would have understood when he wrote it, and that his audience would have understood when they read it and heard it, okay? And then how that applies to us. So let's first take a look at the text that speaks to us about the blessing of partnership. Beginning in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi, he said this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but you lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content. Say content. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. I am able to do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. Paul went on to say, And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift. Listen, listen, listen. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have abundance, and I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, listen, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
And then he signs off on the letter reminding them, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who are in Caesar's household, who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now that Paul has dealt with all of these issues that were going on within the church, particularly the issue of disunity, last week uh, Paul went so far as to address one specific order of disunity in the church, which was an issue between two ladies, uh, Euodia and Syntyche, and we talked about that, and we don't know what the issue was. It could have been centered around their understanding of the gospel and how they were sharing and preaching the gospel. Paul said they were his co-laborers in the gospel, so it could have certainly been that. It could have been that one of them didn't like the way the other one dressed, or uh, we don't really know. Or maybe one thought the other was trying to steal her man. I don't know what it was, but they had an issue, and Paul said, listen, I've already talked to you about this at length, and when I was there, when I planted this church, we started with the foundation of the utmost importance centered on the unity of the believers. Because if there is disunity among the believers, it hinders the work of the Lord. It damages our testimony to the world. They say, those Christians can't even get along. Why? I have enough of that in the world. Why on earth would I want to go into a, into a setting where people who claim to follow and love Jesus can't even get along? I thought I was preaching this morning. but So Paul addresses all of these issues, and then he circles back here to say, Listen, I, I want you to understand something. I am so extremely grateful and rejoice because you have renewed your provision for me. You have renewed the, the fervency of your giving to me, particularly for the work of the ministry. Paul wasn't out here buying a yacht and a private jet and talking about how God told him he's supposed to have a Rolex because so-and-so rapper had a Rolex. And if, if these evil, sinful people can have a Rolex, then why shouldn't God's people be wearing a Rolex? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But uh, that, that's not what Paul is doing here. He's saying, listen, I have, I have laid my life down for the gospel's sake, but it takes money for me to live and commit myself to this. And Paul said it takes money to advance the gospel. It takes resources to advance the gospel. And so this is not to say that Paul primarily wrote this letter for the gift, but it is the thing he mentions first, and it is the thing he comes back to. So it's important that we take a look at it. This is, uh, he instructed them again to adopt the attitude of that which was in Christ. But then down in verse 10, I, I don't want you to miss what Paul says here, as he says, he, he uses this phrase that I rejoiced in the Lord. He rejoiced in the Lord about this gift. That is signifying this three-way relationship that he has with these believers and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, listen, I'm rejoicing that you sent the gift, but I'm rejoicing in the Lord because it's because of the Lord that you and I have this type of friendship that you would feel compelled to renew your support for me. And so don't miss this. Paul expresses that he doesn't rejoice over their gift because he needed it. I'm going to let that sink in for just a moment. You've often maybe heard, and maybe you've never heard, but you'll hear it today, that God doesn't need your money. Giving to the Lord's work is not about God needing your money. It is about whether or not you understand the principle and the relationship behind why you give. And so, so Paul is saying, listen, it's not that I needed it, but that it demonstrates the commitment of relationship, of friendship that we share in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was a common cultural display at that time. In other words, Paul's not diminishing their gift like some theologians like to try to paint a picture or some people talk about Paul. Well, that's pretty ungracious of him. They just sent this massive gift, obviously, to support him. And he said, listen, I didn't really need that, but thanks for sending it anyway. That's not what's happening here. What Paul is trying to, you got to understand, Stoicism was rampant at that time. And if you're familiar with the Stoics, you understand that the Stoics taught self sufficiency. They taught that whatever you needed, the end goal was for you to achieve a level of status where you wanted for nothing, that you were perfectly content, but you were content in what you've accomplished yourself. And so Paul is saying here, listen. It's not that I needed a gift. Why? Because I have learned how to be content in all circumstances. Whether I've been fed well, whether or not, whether I've, I've been clothed or naked, whether I've had plenty or whether I've been in need, it doesn't really matter because I can do all things. Here it is. 
Not through myself, as the Stoics taught, not self-sufficiency, but Christ-sufficiency. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul is combating this self-sufficient teaching of the Stoics during his day, and that's why it's so important for us to understand contextually why Paul spends so much time talking about this gift. He talks about content, and again, as Gordon Fee says, contentment in the Bible, this word, it, it gives off a sense that it expresses the ultimate goal of Stoicism, which was to be content, to live above need and above in an abundance in such a way as to be, again, self-sufficient, not meaning one is oblivious to their circumstances, but that they, the truly autarkis person, that's the Greek word, the truly content person is not determined by such. So Paul uses this language that the Philippians would have recognized that the goal to achieving true biblical Christ-centered contentment is found only in Christ's sufficiency and not self-sufficiency. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 1, if we were to spin back to verse 21, he said, for, for uh, me to live is Christ. Everything about my life is centered on my Christ's sufficiency. Let me ask you a question this morning. How are you doing at adopting that attitude of saying, I need to go to work, yes, bills to pay, but I understand that the only reason I have a job is because God allows me to have a job. The only reason I'm able to go to work is because God puts breath in my body and makes me physically able. The only way I'm able to concentrate and accomplish my work is because God is keeping my mind intact so that I can do the work because it is all things through Christ who strengthens me that I'm able to do those things. And until we get to a mindset that, it is about our ability to understand what it means to be put our entire life centered on Christ's sufficiency. We will continue to follow the way of the world, pursuing all of the materialism and everything, thinking somehow those things are going to bring us joy. But as Paul has talked about repeatedly, the way that you find joy is by being rooted and centered in Christ Jesus alone. You see, we're taught in Scripture, when it, just, just a little caveat here as we're unpacking this foundation. I hadn't even got to the message yet. Just hang on with me. We are taught in Scripture that we should never forget the Lord when we begin to experience abundance and provision financially or materially. I mean, isn't that what he's saying? He said that you, you have renewed your support for me, right? But there was a time when you weren't able to do that. But now that somehow God was blessing them again... They immediately, their first reaction is, we need to get back to supporting the work of the Lord and supporting Paul, our brother, who is desperately in need. And then, you know, even if you were to jump back to Deuteronomy and you would see this picture that is painted in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, listen, carefully follow every command I am giving you today so that you, so that you may live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your ancestors. Listen, remember that the Lord God led you on an entire journey, now speaking to the Israelites here who came out of Egypt, led you on an entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he, listen, might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry, then he gave you manna to eat. When you and your ancestors had not known so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Uh, many times people are going through something, and the moment that their, 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 their income increases, the first thing they do is not think about how they can increase in their support of the Lord's work. It's how can I increase my own living? How can I increase my own, uh, uh, you know, get a bigger house, get a new car? Uh, listen to me. It's tax season. If you haven't done this already, if you made this mistake, just trust the Lord. He'll forgive you. But listen, taxes come around. And everybody's thinking about their taxes, and now if you need a car, you got to get a car. But tax season is the worst time to buy a car. Now, if you're in here or watching and you're a car salesman, I'm sorry, I'm about to damage your business for a moment. But what you don't do is just run out and, and go get a car note with your tax money. And then say, look, at the Lord bless me with this new car. The Lord don't bless people through debt. That's a curse. The Bible says that the borrower becomes a, help me, a slave to the lender. What happens when you get increase? Do you immediately think about how you can level up in your own comforts and desires, or do you think about the Lord's work and the people who die every day exiting this world, not knowing the Lord Jesus, to spend eternity separated from God? The Christians in Philippi had a concept. They had an understanding of Christ's sufficiency. When we had lack, 
We weren't able. They were so much in lack that they couldn't do anything. But if you go back and actually read, you'll find out that the Christians in Macedonia, Paul said, during their lack in the beginning, the first offering they sent, he said they were so perplexed and poor and persecuted, Paul didn't even ask them to give in the offering. But you know the story, or you should by now, if you've been around Renew for any length of time. They pleaded with Paul to give in that offering anyway. So even when they were in their lack, they were giving. But it must have gotten so bad at some point because it says they were unable to give for a period of time. But the moment they began to experience any level of financial income coming back to them, they prioritized first and foremost renewing their support for the work of the Lord. So listen, when we're struggling with lack and or suffering, we need to trust God. And then when we are walking in abundance, we need to walk in humility and generosity as we've been learning through Paul's letter. Paul is certainly appreciative of the gift, but it's clear that his focus is on these things, the, what the gift demonstrates. So what did this gift demonstrate? And what does it demonstrate in your life when you give faithfully and generously to the work of the Lord? One, that God is at work in their lives. It demonstrated to Paul. He says that. The gift, verse 10, is done out of their love and friendship with Paul. They didn't give it out of obligation. They did it because of their love and their friendship and their commitment to the gospel. Number, verse 14, we see that they were partnering with Paul in his hardship and the work of the gospel. And then uh, in verse 18, we see that their gift was a sacrificial offering to God. Their gift was an act of worship. And I'm convinced that so many people don't give because they have a faulty understanding of what biblical giving and generosity is and should look like. Let me just say this as I preface the message before we get into the meat. This should be, I think, on your handout. And if it's not, it'll be on the screen. Yeah, I was reaching uh, in preaching today, I was reading and pre preaching today an article that, that pointed out that Jesus talked a lot about money. I mean, if you've read the Gospels, you know that Jesus talked a lot about money. In fact, 16 of the 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions, almost half of them. Now, in the Gospels, an amazing one out of 10 verses, 288 verses in all, deal directly with the subject of money. You don't think it, Jesus understood that this would be a hang-up for so many people. And then the Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. It's not to say that prayer is less important than stewardship. It's to say that prayer would be something that Jesus and, and, and God seemed to think that we would be able to grab a hold of a little bit easier. That, that, that understanding that faith is a topic and a subject matter that, that we would be able to, you can't even come to God without faith, right? You can't, you can't get saved without faith. But something about transitioning into a life of Christ, Jesus and the Lord and God, like they knew that there was going to be an issue with people in their pocketbook. So the Bible talks a lot about this and he says, listen, what do we take away from Paul's way that he shows his love and his appreciation about this gift, but while he uses this opportunity to also teach them about some motives and some methods behind giving. So what I want to talk today, again, is about the blessing of partnership. On your handout, there are several things I want to point out to you. We learn from Paul's letter to the Philippians here in this passage that we should have a heart of gratitude. Gratitude. Back in verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me, but you lacked the opportunity to show it. There it is. You were concerned. You wanted to, but you lacked the opportunity. Now, again, I've already established that prior to this, they were already poor. They were already struggling, and they gave. So it's not to say that because you don't make this much or that much, you shouldn't give anything. What he's saying is now something has shifted because there came a point where you couldn't do anything at all, literally. And now he's saying, you have renewed this care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but you lacked the opportunity. Paul is showing this tremendous gratitude for the gift. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all know somebody? Don't point or don't shout out any names. But how many of y'all know somebody? They're not thankful for anything. It's almost like they're an adult or it could be one of your teenagers. But it's almost like when they were little kids or you knew little kids or you see the videos of the little kids, the funny videos, and I don't think it's really that funny because if you're a parent, you spend your hard-earned money, it ain't funny, right? We laugh at it later. But it's like the kid who you, you went out and you tried to get them the perfect gift for their birthday or the perfect gift for Christmas. 
And you're so excited on Christmas morning or on at their birthday for them to open that gift that you went like Arnold Schwarzenegger running around town and, and wrestling people in the store because trying to get the last one of that thing so you could give it to your child. And they open it and they say what? That's not, that's not the one I wanted. See, we're laughing about it, right? It wasn't funny when you did it because you know what you went through to get it. But we all know people like that. Adults, you bless them, you do something for them, you go out of your way to try to encourage them. That's not the way I wanted you to bless me. I was sharing, I was talking the other day, one of my, one of my great friends who's with the Lord now, he came into some money through a, a, a land deal he had brokered for his family that had owned a bunch of land not far from here. And he brokered a deal with one of the one of the plants along the river that wanted to purchase some of that land. And after he brokered that deal, it worked out that, I don't remember the exact amount, but that I want to say it was around $3 million each that he and his siblings and his mom got out of that deal. And, but what happened is he was so excited that he had this increase that he called his pastor, set up a meeting to take his pastor out to lunch. And he was about to bless this man. Now, if you do math, even if you don't ascribe to tithing, that is a barometer that most people use as a gauge of how much they think they should give to the Lord. And a tithe being a tenth or the first tenth. Um, so you would think on $3 million, that would be $300,000, right? So he takes his pastor out to lunch to a really nice steak house down in New Orleans. And, and after they're talking and he's telling him about what happened... And he tells him, you know, how his portion of this blessing of this deal he brokered was $3 million. And so he says, so I've been praying about it, and I, I just want to bless the church with this money. It's at your discretion and the elders' discretion how you want to distribute it. I'm not applying any, any stipulations to it. I just believe the Lord wants me to do this. The pastor opens up the check. It's a million dollars. He's giving 33%, a million dollars. I kid you not, the pastor looks at him and says, what I really need is $2 million. And, and let me back up and, and qualify this before you think that that's actually a pastor. I should have said the pastor. The problem that we face today for many people is a lack of gratitude. As Christians, we should be leading the way in expressing gratitude when someone blesses us. So how are you doing at expressing gratitude to others who blessed you? And, and how are you doing at expressing your gratitude to the Lord for the many ways that he blesses you? Just a rhetorical question. Let me give you the second thing we learn from this section of Paul's letter in the closing section. We learn that we should embrace contentment. We, we, we should embrace it, right? Embrace means to hold on to tightly. We need to hold on and embrace contentment. Let me just go back and read the 11 through 13 verses. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little. I know how to make do with a lot. In any in and in all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or need. I am able to do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. Let me just say it this way. I've said this before. And I want to say it again, it's on your handout, but until Christ is enough, you will always be found wanting more. Until you understand what Christ's sufficiency is, that contentment in Christ, the goal of contentment is that God, if you never give me anything else, you've already been good enough to me. God, I know that in my flesh, it frustrates me when I see all of these other people experiencing these blessings of God, and I'm sitting over here trying to figure out how I'm going to pay the light bill. But I have learned how to be content in all things because I can do, say all with me, all things through Christ who gives me strength. When we are discontent and we are unable to be thankful for what Christ has already done for us through redeeming us, it shows that we have not truly understood and embraced the fullness of the gospel. See, people will spend their entire lives chasing money 
And they will spend their entire lives chasing material things while never understanding the, the contentment that Paul displayed and talks about here. Yet no matter how much they gain, they still lack joy. Why? Because money and material things can never replace the fulfillment that can only be found in contentment in Christ. So, because renew is the name of our church, and there's so many passages in Scripture that talk about renewing, and in Romans 12, 2, the renewing of the mind, let me just suffice it to say that a mind that has been renewed in Christ moves from self-sufficiency to Christ-sufficiency. A mind that has truly been renewed in Christ moves away from that and embraces biblical, gospel-centered, Christ-sufficient contentment. And then we learn also that we should give generously to the work of the gospel. Again, I've already mentioned we don't, we don't really teach tithing. I'm not, I'm not anti-tithing. If that's the barometer you use, I've had many conversations with people about that. I don't think there's anything in the New Testament that says stop tithing. We are not under the law, and I understand, but if you really study the Old Testament, you'll be hard-pressed to tell me that the tithe began under the law. The tithe was going on uh, giving the first and the best, and the tenth was going on long before the law was ever implemented. And when Jesus came, he actually told some of the people, he said, you do well in giving the tithe. But you're neglecting the weightier matters. You know, you're, you're neglecting loving people the way you're supposed to and those things. So he said, it's not good enough. You think just because you give money, you're good, but you need to focus on how you love one another and how you care for one another. He never, ever said stop. So, but we don't, yeah, that's a good place to thank the Lord. Listen, but we don't, but the Bible never says stop tithing. And so, so if that's your barometer, that's fine. That's just not what we teach here. And let me tell you why. We don't teach that here. We teach generous giving because we believe that the New Testament model, as we're seeing with the Macedonian Christians, particularly those here in Philippi, that they were generous givers. The model for us in the New Testament church is generous giving. So let's take a look here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He said, still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. And we've already established what was their condition at that time. They were poor. They were facing tremendous persecution and struggles and challenges, and yet they gave generously to the work of the Lord. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need, not once, several times, out of their lack. So listen, let me just say, a person who supports the ministry faithfully and generously, what Paul is saying, demonstrates that they have moved from being a consumer to being a partner in the gospel. Uh, in full transparency, I probably should have started with this, but in full transparency, I and many other pastors I know, we wrestle with how to talk about giving biblically and how often. And, and we all know, as I've already pointed out one particular one, we all know that there are false teachers out there who take advantage of churchgoers for personal gain. We, we, we know that they preach a false gospel of prosperity, even though Paul debunks that theology here in his letter to the Philippians and many other places as well. But on the flip side, there's also a false poverty gospel the false poverty gospel is that everyone should be poor for the sake of the gospel, that if you go get anything new for yourself, you somehow are not really surrendered to the Lord. You're being selfish, and that's a false gospel as well. I've said many, things, many times, I believe the Bible's clear, there's nothing wrong with having nice things as long as your things don't have you. As long as you're prioritizing the Lord and giving faithfully and generously to the work of the Lord, if you want to, you know, buy some nice clothes and buy some nice clothes, you know, if you want, whatever, you want to go on a vacation, nobody should be looking at you sideways if you're faithfully supporting the work of the Lord. But because of the many false teachers and the many false messages that are out there regarding biblical giving, you can understand why so many preachers like myself are reluctant to even have a conversation about giving. But here's what I've learned. The Bible, as we've already established in the beginning, talks a lot about this issue because this is one of the real issues that hinders not only an individual spiritual growth, as we're going to see in just a moment, but it hinders the work of the Lord. As we've learned, it was an important issue to Jesus. It was an important issue carried by Paul, and we must understand that just because some people hijack the Bible's teaching on giving and they distort it for their personal gain, that does not negate what the Bible actually does teach about generous giving to the work of the Lord and the mission of God through the local church. The unfortunate reality is this, that too many people are enjoying the benefits of the local church ministry without faithfully supporting that ministry. Oh. All right, I'm going home. Like, I was waiting for somebody to say, say it louder for the people in the back, Pastor, you know. <laughs> Type that if you're watching online. Say it louder for the people in the back. Can we, can we be honest? We already established, and I didn't do it this week. I said, you know, I feel like I should start 
Last week I said, I feel like this is how I should start every sermon, because of how much I love you, you're my joy and my crown, and, you know, and then, and then let me just put you over my knee for a minute. Now, lest this happens, because it has happened before in my previous church, there, there was one individual that I found out that left the church when I, when I talked on biblical stewardship, because they felt, I, I, clearly that was their own conviction, because it was not what I said. What I am saying is, if you're winning in this area, praise the Lord. I'm not talking to you. What I'm doing right now is equipping you to have the same conversation with others who you know are not winning in this area. So we have to have the conversation because it's in the scriptures, but the unfortunate reality is that too many are enjoying the benefits of the local church ministry without faithfully supporting that ministry. So let me just ask a few rhetorical questions. I'm trying to be conscious here of my time. Can I just go five minutes over today? Say yes. You didn't have an option there. I was going to do it anyway. Just five minutes is all I'm asking for today, just an extra five minutes. Listen, why do you think it is that so many people get offended or, disre- or disregard sound teaching on biblical giving? Rhetorical questions here. just want you to think about it. Why do you think so many who profess to love Jesus Christ don't follow his teachings on giving? And, and specifically giving faithfully, giving consistently, and giving generously. Why, why is it people say they love Jesus, but they don't do that? Why? Or what do you think, why do you think that people will spend $100 to $200 a month on some fancy coffee but only give $10 to $20 to the Lord's work? It's getting quiet. Why do you think that people spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on recreation a month or a year? Recreation, what, what, recreation whatever, sports, eating out. Movies, parties, new clothes, accessories. Nothing wrong with buying new clothes. We've already talked about that. But we'll spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month or a year on those things, yet give $10, $20, $50, $100 to the church. Why? We've already established there are false teachers. But guess what? There are sinners in church too. There, unfortunately, are sinners and false teachers, as Paul addresses in some of his subsequent letters, that you need to be aware of, because just because they stand up and say, I'm speaking on behalf of Jesus, doesn't mean they're speaking on behalf of Jesus. Guess what happens when you find out you got a bad teacher at school? They fire that teacher, but you know what you don't do? Yank your kids out of school. Right? You don't tell the government, stop giving my tax dollars to that school because of one bad teacher. You deal with that issue. False teachers are not the problem, y'all. A false perspective of biblical giving is the problem. Which leads me to the many reasons that people maybe don't follow Jesus and Paul's teachings. One, maybe they lack gratitude for the Lord and his church, going back to point one of our sermon. Maybe they just really lack gratitude. Or maybe they lack contentment that Paul talked about. They're busy focusing on their self and what they think they need or want rather than being biblically content. I believe that's another reason. I think many people lack the faith. I think they struggle with their faith. That's an area where you call on the Lord to help increase it. Can I tell you, full disclosure, when I met my, my wife, I've said this many times, I was poor, poor, poor. I was a broke college student. There's no way this woman's gonna go out with me and marry me when the best I can do on our first date is take her to Denny's and we split an appetizer sampler. Is it, am, I, am I lying, baby? That, that's, that, that was our first date. Well, actually, the first date is still good. <laughs> We're going to do it again, baby. We need to do that anniversary uh, Denny's dinner. I, did we even got Denny's around here in Baton Rouge? I don't even know. But, uh, uh, you know, here's the reality. I didn't have any money. So guess what? We were going to church at that time, and men of God, women of God in the church, the mothers in the church were pulling me aside. They were discipling me. They were pouring into me. I was growing in the Lord. When I had some needs, guess what? Uh, One particular pastor said, why don't you ever wear a suit? Ever. Like even when I showed up at funeral, I said, because I don't have any money. I'm a broke college student. I don't even own a suit. He took me to his house, opened up his closet, and said, pick out a suit. I guess what size shoe you wear? I said, a 13. He wore a 12. He said, just try on some of these shoes and see if any of them fit. And I walked out of there with a suit and shoes. This church was blessing me, but guess what I was saying? I don't have any money to give to the church because I'm a broke college student. I didn't have an understanding of biblical giving. 
But praise the Lord that other people came alongside and did what I'm equipping you to now do is go and have the conversation and help people get a proper, not, don't talk to me about prosperity preachers because this ain't a prosperity preaching church. We don't have, come on, Pastor Joe, we don't have no mansion and Mercedes fund at Renew Church, what I call the M&M fund. We don't have no private jet fund. I'm never going to stand up here and tell you that God told me I need a new jet because the one I got that costs tens of millions of dollars ain't good enough, and now I need a new one, and I need y'all to pay for it. That's never going to happen here. Here, we look around our city, and we see the brokenness and the darkness, and we say there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, 642,000 people in greater Baton Rouge that do not attend a Bible teaching church. We have work to do, but guess what? It does take resources. Guess what? We need to hire some staff. Guess what? We have repairs on our facility that we need to do so that we can continue to do ministry. Guess what? We have children's ministry. We got outreaches. We got other mission work that we're trying to do, but guess what? We have to every year scrap a whole bunch of stuff off the list of things that we really believe God is leading us to do because we don't have the resources. And Paul is saying, listen, if you have a proper perspective of what's going on, with your money, and that, and which leads me to the final point, that our giving is an act of worship. When we give, he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing in your account. Let me just go ahead and deal with the elephant in the room. He ain't saying that if you give, like I'm not going to stand up here and say, all right, God told me there's 10 people in here supposed to give $1,000. Come on, run up here and put it up here right now. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm saying I'm not going to do that. Y'all, some of y'all are like, What? You, you've never even heard of that. Well, come on, those of those, you all know what I'm talking about. And Nicole and I were in that church. They held us hostage for three hours. So people were writing bad checks just so we could get out of there. Some of y'all are like, what are checks? Like, everything's digital now. I'm, but back in the day, there was no online giving, no text to give. You wrote checks or you put cash in the plate. I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. We're not going to do that because I don't know what the Lord is telling you to give. What I do know is he's telling you to give faithfully, consistently, and generously to the work of the Lord because it is your act of worship. He goes on. The prophet is not always money. The point is this text, what Paul is talking about is spiritually. It's all about context. Pastors take this passage and they say, God's going to profit your account. He is, your spiritual account. That's what he's talking about here. By you giving faithfully, generously, and consistently, he's saying you are showing that you are maturing in Christ, that you are growing, and God is pouring out his spiritual blessings on you. Anyway, let me move on. He says, I, uh, he says but I have received everything in full. I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided. Here it is, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And then, again, he goes on to say what? And my God, he makes it personal. He said, the God that I serve will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is the God I serve. And you're like, but, but what about this? But what about that? Listen, I don't have time to unpack all that today. Maybe I'll do a follow-up article and send, it, send an email out that I, in, on my newsletter. So if you, don't, if you hadn't filled out something and given us your email, do it. I, I'll commit. I'm just going to make that commitment now. I'm going to come back and unpack that verse because I don't have time today, but that's not really where I want to focus. The focus that Paul is talking about here is that a heart that is proper, as, as Catherine comes, that, that a heart that is properly postured towards the Lord will see giving, listen to me, as a privilege rather than an obligation. Paul didn't use manipulation or guilt or to teach Christians how and why they should give to the work of the Lord. He simply taught that giving is just as important as praying, as serving, and as sharing the message of the gospel. He was clear to point out that giving faithfully and generously demonstrates that a person is profiting spiritually. Additionally, Paul made it clear that God is glorified when we worship him through giving as we partner in the gospel work. So if you were wondering today, you thought you got a pass because I didn't take up the offering earlier. I'm, it's not manipulation. I just felt like some of us have never truly been taught what the Bible teaches about giving. So would it not make sense for me to move the offering to the end today to say now that you have a better understanding of what the Bible says about biblical giving, now that hopefully you see it as an act of worship and not an obligation, our ushers are going to move into place, but before they do, I, I, I want to talk about the spiritual account that profits. I want to talk first to those of you who would say, I don't know that I even have a spiritual account. 
because you can't have that spiritual account that profits in Christ apart from Christ. So maybe you're here today and you would say, you know, I've never come to a place in my life where I've called on Jesus to save me. And that would be your, your step today would be to, be to start there. To acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. He's the only one that can redeem you from the penalties of your sin. He's the only one that can adopt you into God's family and grant you eternal life in his kingdom. There's no other way. As I shared at, 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 at one of the celebration of life services yesterday, Jesus makes it abundantly clear. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So for you, establishing your spiritual account begins with calling on Jesus to save you. So if you're here today, I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads or close your eyes. I'm just going to kind of do it because I I imagine that the disciples didn't do that. I I don't even know when that started. I imagine that people started asking people to bow their heads and close their eyes to eliminate distraction. So I'm not saying there's a problem with it. But I think you can easily focus on what I'm saying right now just as much with your eyes open looking at me. So hear me clearly. If you're here today and you cannot say beyond a shadow of a doubt that at some point you've repented of your sin, that you've turned away from your sin, confessed it to God, and said, Jesus, come in my life and save me. I'm committing my life to you in faith, believing your word, that you will adopt me into your family. If you've never done something like that, then right now you just... Say that to the Lord, however you see fit. You can say it silently, you can say it out loud. You can say, you know, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And Jesus is my only hope of salvation. So I'm calling on you, Jesus, to save me from my sins. I confess my sins to you. I thank you for your forgiveness. I commit my life to you from this day forward. And the Bible says that if you mean that, if you meant it, if it moves from head knowledge down into your heart and you meant it, That you are saved. You don't have to wonder when you leave here if you're going to heaven. You're going to heaven. You're not going to be perfect by any means, but you're going to be in a process now that begins. Your spiritual bank account is now open. And God's going to begin to make deposits in that spiritual account as you begin to be faithful and as you grow in him and you work out your own salvation as Paul talked about. Not work for your salvation, but work out your salvation. So maybe that's your first step today. And I pray that if you do that, that you would let us know some way. If you're watching online, send us a message and let us know that you did that, that you gave your life to Jesus today. If you're here, you know, on the connect card right at the bottom, I I accepted Christ today or I accepted Jesus today, something like that. But for the rest of us, I'm going to do our, our, our altar ministry here, our prayer ministry here different today. Rather than leading a prayer, because we've just walked through the word of God, the ushers are going to move into place and we're going to receive our offering. And I'm just going to ask you to let the Lord minister to you. And maybe you've already given. I know a lot, a lot of times that's the case. People give electronically or whatever. So whether you're going to give in person or electronically, they're going to put a slide up that tells you the many different ways that you can give. But here's what, here's what I'm, I'm appealing to you. Please hear, hear my heart. Look, we need it <laughs> to do some things. Here, but hear me clearly. Do not give if you feel that we manipulated you in any way today, that I manipulated you in any way. You hold on to that until you feel that your heart is right about that because that is not our intent. And all of our lead team are like, don't say that. But I want you to hear me. If you feel like you've been manipulated in some way, then hold on to that and you talk to the Lord about that. Additionally, I, we want you to be prayerful as you give, which is what we've always asked. You now have maybe learned something new about what the Bible teaches us about giving. So we want you to be prayerful as you give. So that's why I'm not going to lead a prayer at this moment. I just want you to pray as you prepare to give or as you think about giving next week. And then the third thing I'm going to ask is that don't let it just be today. Just like you don't stop sharing the gospel because you went out and did it one time, you don't stop giving faithfully, consistently, and generously one time after one time. So you ask the Lord to help you grow in this area of giving. And again, if you're winning in this area, then you help us disciple our church with those you encounter. So with that said, we're going to uh, ask you to, however you're giving, whether text to give, whether giving online, whether giving in person, mailing your gift, however you choose to give, the ushers are going to begin to distribute uh, the baskets at this time, and you give as the Lord leads. And then in just a moment, I will close us in prayer and give us a few closing announcements. Spend this time talking to the Lord about your giving. Maybe, again, you've already given electronically. Maybe you've already mailed your gift in, however you've done it, but Use this time to seek the Lord about being faithful in this area. Since I didn't say it at the beginning, I do want to circle back and say, 
how grateful I am for each of you. There are a lot of churches. There are a lot of great churches. But you choose Renew. You choose to be here, to serve, to be a part of our church family, to give, to be a reflection of heaven here on earth. And I am eternally grateful for that. The reason I felt compelled to come up after the song Victory and have us sing it again is while I talk to you about the things that you might be going through, I know you would never guess this, but pastors go through things too. And sometimes we have to be reminded that we have the victory, that no matter what tries to come against, listen to me, me personally, or, and I'm not even speaking about anything specific right now, it's just Paul's letter so impacted me that above all, other than proclaiming Christ, we have to protect the unity of our church. And I'm so thankful for everybody that God leads through our doors. But what I know, having pastored for 12 years, is there are a lot of external forces. I'm not even talking about internal at this point. I've already kind of, I think, I think you all do a phenomenal job of walking together. We have disagreements at times. We have sometimes debates and even arguments. But we always seem to find a way to come back and allow the Lord to minister. So I'm not even talking about internal. But the world is crazy. And there are a lot of efforts outside the church that are trying to, not the church, not just renew, that are trying to disrupt the, the work of the Lord. And I would tell you that sometimes even I have to remind myself that we already are victorious. Jesus said these words, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, with that said, I would covet your prayers for our leadership team, for our church family as a whole, that we would be bound together tighter than ever before, closer than ever before, because we say, listen, we, we can disagree on things. But as we learned last week, right, we have to choose to be offended or we can choose to be a grace walker. And we have to extend grace to one another. I'm working on that myself. I'm trying to be better at that. But we all need to walk that way, right, so we can protect the unity of our church so that God can be glorified and the gospel will go forth. With that said, let me pray. Father, I thank you today for this church family, even those that aren't able to be here with us today. Father, in spite of all of our differences, not, not differences like age or, or ethnicity or any of those things, but in spite of all of our differences just from our own life experiences, God, I thank you that somehow, some way, you always lead us to a place where we can come together and sit down and, and reason together for the sake of the gospel. So, Father, I pray that you would help me to do better in that. Help our church, God, to walk with such a level of grace, making allowance for one another's faults. God, that we would have such a reflection of unity that Jesus prayed for, that we would be one as he and the Father are one. So, Father, we thank you for the ways that you bless us. We thank you for the fact that we're able to sit in this building today and worship you for all of the people that serve so faithfully to make it happen, all of the people who give so faithfully to make it happen. And God, our goal is that you be glorified. Our goal is that countless others come to faith in Christ and become strong disciples who make other disciples. That we can impact our city, our community, our neighborhood, our families with the gospel. So Father, we just give you glory. We give you honor. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. That at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is in that name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you for tearing with me for just a moment, uh, uh, going a little bit longer today. Um, I just want to remind you to take a moment to turn in your Connect card or fill out the online Connect card. Um, also to register. Listen, we desperately need... If you're available, uh, or clear your calendars. We have a lot of people that are going to be out of town that week. I think that's part of the challenge 
Um, but if you are here and available, we, we're, we need everybody to sign up. So uh, there is the, there's the paper insert in there. If you don't want to do a paper one, you can go to the back of your bulletin on the back. There's a QR code for the events page. Just scroll down. You'll see all of our events, but you will see where you can register as a volunteer there. So please do that today so we can get a count when we have our staff meeting tomorrow and know where we stand as far as uh, staffing the event for Saturday. Um, secondly, we're going to have some things that we need to do this week to get prepared for that. So if you're available for the week, check in with us at the office. Uh, if you're available during the day, we have some tasks and preparation work for that. Then lastly, I just want to remind you to turn in your Connect cards on the way out. And for our first-time guests, we have a special gift for you. So on your way out, please stop and see us. Oh, I almost forgot uh, that we have the green serve, serve team shirts. They, they, we have some left over uh, that were here before. We, we're, if you're able to get, pick, pick one up, uh, they're only like $10 um, to wear those for the event or any time you serve or you may just want one. But we also have more that are coming in on Wednesday, so we will have those available uh, at the event on Saturday morning. So those are, those are $10 for the serve team shirts. They're bright green so that when people come in, in the midst of hundreds of people, they can easily identify who our people are. You don't have to buy one. We just encourage you to do that if you want one. And so those are in the foyer. You can go to the information desk to get them. With that said, uh, we're going to turn your attention for the closing announcements. As soon as this video ends, you are dismissed. Good morning, and welcome to Renew Church. My name is Jasmine. Whether you're in the building or have joined us online, we are so blessed that you chose to worship with us today. If you're a first-time guest, please make sure to head to the foyer after service where you can exchange your Connect card for a first-time guest gift. We would also ask that everyone turn in their Connect card to an usher on your way out. If you joined us online, please fill out an online Connect card found on our website at renewchurchonline.org so that we know you worship with us. And please, don't forget to share your prayer request and your praise report. Oftentimes in life, we run into challenges and obstacles, and no one should have to go through that alone. That's why we have Connect Groups at Renew Church. A Connect Group is a small group of people who get together weekly to do life together and grow in their relationship with the Lord. If you're not in a Connect Group, we want to encourage you to pray about joining one. For more information about group times and locations, you can call the church office at 225-272-3740. Hey, Renew Church family, Pastor Checkers here. We are excited because we have an opportunity to engage our city with the gospel. And so I'm here with my friend Daryl, and in just a moment, he's going to tell you about a great event that's coming up. But we don't want to just show up at this event. We want to be prepared for this event. So we're offering another evangelism training that he's going to facilitate on April the 6th. And I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about that as well as the event. So Daryl, tell him what's going to be happening. Listen to me, April 27 and 28, outside of Memorial Stadium, we're holding a big gospel fest called the Lit Fest. Yes, you heard me right. The Lit Fest. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have bounce houses. We're going to have train rides. We're going to have a model climbing wall, vendors, food trucks. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But this is the thing. The best part about it is we're going to preach the gospel and many people are going to come and get saved. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. Yeah, and so where we come in is they're going to need to connect those people who respond to the gospel to a local church and we want to be there in full effect we're, we're going to train you equip you and be ready through our evangelism training on april 6th here at the church and you're going to see details about that on our website as well as in a bulletin so register for that we're going to equip you and prepare you so that we can help these folks who respond to the gospel get connected to the church you don't want to miss it stay tuned for the details in the bulletin and on our website and we are excited about how god is going to reach and transform lives in our city Hey ladies, Saturday, April 13th, we will be having our next Women's Fellowship. It'll be a brunch style gathering. You're invited to join us here at the church from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. for an amazing time of fellowship, prayer, and Bible study. We look forward to seeing you there. Mark your calendars because our next Discover Renew Luncheon is Sunday, April 14th, immediately following our Sunday morning worship service. If you're new to Renew Church or have never attended our Discover Renew Luncheon, we want to invite you to join us for this free luncheon where you will learn about the vision, values, and beliefs of Renew Church, as well as how to become a member. You can RSVP by writing luncheon on your Connect card and handing it to an usher on your way out today. RSVPs are appreciated, but not required. So we hope you'll join us Sunday, April 14th for this free luncheon. If you've missed any of our previous sermons or series, you can watch them on our website at renewchurchonline.org. And you can also download the sermon notes. Thank you for joining us here at Renew Church. And we pray that you have a blessed day. All right.
Y'all have a great day today. So glad y'all came. We're going to sing you out. Remember this. As you leave today, your Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. That means forever. Come on. That's worth worshiping about. Woo! Good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah! 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 We worship you for who you are. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good, sir. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you for who you are. We worship you because who you we are. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 We worship for who you are. Yeah, you are Good. Jay, good to see you, brother. <laughs>